for mesenchymal cells, there, there's this paper, and, and there were a lot of other papers, but just to summarize, this, these were human cells into rats. So a lot of people get hung up on, hey, it's a donor, Why, you know, is it going to even work? Well, these are human cells in a rat, right? I mean, you talk about anagenicity, they're hugely different, right? And, and these human cells, they survived without any immunosuppression. And there's a lot of dogma, unfortunately, with heme onc guys, that they, they can only think, oh, if you're going to give cells from somebody else, that you have to give immunosuppression or they're not going to survive. My argument is, and the data show, that they, not, only do they, not only do they survive, they secrete proteins that stimulate regeneration, then they mature, and then they go away, which, is, which again, is a good thing. So they showed that they gave these cells, in this particular article, they gave them intravenously and they migrated into the spinal cord at the site of injury. This was, new, this was news to me. They did not, again, become neurons, but they did enhance the recovery of the, of the animals and they pr promoted axonal growth and supported remyelina remyelination of the, of the spinal cord. So with that, we finally consented and we, uh, the doctors decided to go ahead and treat him. We did not, we didn't have a, uh, a doctor who was willing to do intrathecal injections of stem cells at that time. So we only treated, he was treated only intravenously with multiple infusions of the MSCs and CD34s. I went on a trip, he was treated for a period of 10 days when I returned, and they said, man, you gotta see this. So I went into the room and he, you know, he was strapped in his chair because he was T4. He didn't have any of his abdominal muscles at all. He didn't, you know, he, he, had, he would just fall over if he didn't have his support. And he also, he was winged and he couldn't lift his arms up like that. And I walked in the room, he goes, man, I got to show you. Like this, like this. And then he goes, check this out. He leans forward, leans this way, leans this way, right? And this was after 10 days. And uh, so I was, I was pretty excited about it. And, and uh, he, actually, uh, he actually gained everything down to his hips. He could transfer himself. And, and uh, you know, it was a huge life change for him because he couldn't transfer himself. He couldn't, basically couldn't do anything for himself prior to that. So that was the major benefit that he got. And then he came back a, a little over a year later and got another treatment. And he, he regained erectile function, which was obviously huge, and he, and he gained urinary function. And um, so I'll, I'll stop there on that case, and I'll talk about the next case, which is Juan Carlos Murillo, who's, I don't know if anybody's seen videotapes of this guy, but he's a pilot from, from Costa Rica, and he had a plane crash, and, and he basically had nothing below his belly button. And I'm going to show a video later that has Juan Carlos in it, and, and he's actually speaking at the podium which he walked up to. So Juan Carlos, um, because he was Costa Rican, his treatment could be spread out over time rather than just jamming it. Typically what we do is we have people there for a month and we, and, and we, we take out the bone marrow and then we do all this, you know, we do everything in a month and then typically come back two or three times. But Juan Carlos was in Costa Rica, so rather than everything squished in, he, was, he did it over time. But he was treated only with umbilical cord the two cell types, CD34s and MSCs. But now we had an anesthesiologist at the hospital who trained in Miami, and he was willing to do the intrathecal injections as well. So Juan Carlos got intravenous infusions of both cell types, and he got intrathecal into the spinal fluid, uh, a multitude of these things. And after, I'll let him tell his story on, on his video, but suffice it to say, at this point, <clears throat> he could walk in this room and you couldn't pick him out of the crowd, you know. He has a little bit, he drags his, one of his legs a little bit, it's a little, little bit behind the other one, but he has regained sexual function, urinary function, bowel function, has f full sensory, and he even passed his commercial pilot's license, physical, which is, I don't think I could pass it. But <clears throat> Anyway, we wrote, his, uh, <clears throat> we wrote his case up and it was published in... Uh, in the International Archives of Medicine. This was in 2010. And in that, going to the, the transparency deal, you know, we publish, we say exactly what we did. We used these cells this many times. They were from this source. This is how we expanded. This is how we isolated them. Now, there are no secrets at our place. You know, no, no trade secrets or anything else. We tell everybody exactly what we did. And everything is in there. 
<clears throat> so, <clears throat> then, so that was in 2010. 2008 was the first article using stromal cells, mesenchymal cells from the bone marrow. And these were autologous from the patient themselves. And this was in, 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 uh, in Tokyo where they did, the, in Japan they did this. And that was the first study. So it's, I'm just trying to give you a, a, a contextual time frame of how how little has been known and how rapidly we're, we're advancing. And this same group just published a paper. Uh, this just came out two, three months ago. And this is a pilot study. And basically, they demonstrated that they were, that the autologous, when they like, take out a bone marrow sample, get the mesenchymal cells, grow them up, infuse them in the spine, that was completely safe and it was feasible for spinal cord injury. And about half the patients that were treated had a fantastic recovery in this one. So adding whole bone marrow. So I talked about CD34s and MSCs. And then I read this paper and a couple other papers that came out around the same time. This was in 2008, and this is in Cell Transplantation, which is the highest ranked journal in, in, uh, in cell therapy in the world. And they basically had taken whole bone marrow. This is out of Ecuador. There's another one in Turkey that came out about the same time. And they had taken whole bone marrow and they treated patients and basically they, they had treated 52 patients with spinal cord injury using just their own, they take out a bone marrow sample and they spin it down and you get just the cell layer and then, you know, filter it and then they infuse that both intravenously and intrathecally into the spinal fluid. And um, 52 patients had no tumor formations, no infection, no increased pain, because that's one of your risks, you know, every time you go into the, the spinal space, you could increase neuropathic pain, which is a huge problem with, with a lot of patients. And they, they had eight cases and with two years follow-up, and they had, they basically, they had demonstrated improvements in both the Asia, Barthel, which quality of life, Frankel, and Ashworth scoring systems on, on those patients. Again, it's a small study, but, you know, nobody got hurt. Um, nobody got hurt, and they improved. So it's another tool in our toolbox. So we started discussing, well, should we start adding this to the protocol for spinal cord injury? And that enters Trish Stressman. Trish Stressman and her husband Scott were down there, and I, we, we were actually looking at some new space at the hospital, and, and, and we started talking about this, and I, and I said, you know, we've been talking about, we've seen these studies on, on, on uh, adding bone marrow, and, you know, is it something you're interested in? And they, they said they were, and so they wound up talking to the doctors, and they arranged for her to get a bone marrow aspiration. So she's the first patient to get treated with both the types of umbilical cord cells as well as the, um, as well as the bone marrow from her, from, her own, from her own bone marrow. Trish just had a baby, and I, I, she, she's on the video. I have a video of her, too, so I, I'm not going to talk too much about her, but she just had a baby six months ago. And her name's Savannah Hope, and she's gorgeous. Anyway, maybe you'll, if you're lucky enough, you'll see her soon. Yeah, Savannah Hope. Maybe. So as, as Dr. Paz was alluding to, that it's not maybe the cells become, and these other studies demonstrate that it's not the cells actually doing the work. I mean, they're doing the work, but they're not... Everybody has this concept of stem cells. Oh, okay, you put the stem cells in there, my neuron's broken, it's gonna make a new neuron and it's gonna fix me. That's not how it works, at least in the adult stem cell world. They, they home to areas of inflammation, they home to damaged areas, and they, they're actually smart, they're smart factories. So they, they, they sense what's going on and they secrete the appropriate proteins, right? And in a highly inflammatory environment, they secrete highly anti-inflammatory things. And in organs that aren't gen regenerating properly, they produce more trophic factors that stimulate regeneration. So um, the point is that it's, it's more probably the proteins they produce than it is the, the actual cells. But of course, the cells have to be there to secrete the protein. And, and a study that illustrates this beautifully was done in Taiwan. And this was in 2009 by Dr. Yang. And what they did is they cut the spinal cords of rats. And, and when they do that, the, the spinal cord will retract about one to two millimeters. So you have this gap in there, right? And so what they did is they put in the gap, they took, again, this is, these are human umbilical cord mesenchymal stem cells, human. No, they didn't do any immunosuppression, which goes against dogma. They put them in fibrin, which is sort of a clotting glue that your, your blood will produce. 
and they place them, and I don't know if you can see this, but that, that represent, a cartoon represents the two ends of the spinal cord and the gap where they had cut it, and they play, that's where they placed them, right there. And so what they found was that, that the spinal cords regrew. And the, the other amazing thing, I, w I, I tried to find the histology slide because they, they actually show, they're, because they're human cells, they can put a, a dye specific for human cells and so you can see which ones are human cells and which ones aren't. And the entire regrown spinal cord, all of the neural tissue was rat. It wasn't human. There were a few human cells like, like trapped in there where they regrew around them, but there were no human cells in the spinal cord, in, in the actual nervous tissue. So what it tells us is they were there secreting these proteins and told the spinal cord, hey, regenerate. But we're not, we're not part of the deal. We're just here to direct traffic. And that's what they did. And the vast majority of them, by the time they, they resected them, most of, the, most of the human cells were dead. I mean, they were gone, not dead. They were completely gone. And there were a the few of these trapped. And this, is, this just shows... This is the functional recovery of the, the, the nerve fibers. And you can see the control, it's around 200 uh, here. And then the stem cells, it's over 800. And then they, they actually, this is a cool part of it. They took stem cells and they conditioned medium with them. So they grew them. And then they just took the juice that the cells were growing in and they put that in there too. Not, so in another group of animals, they did juice, right? And the juice works. This doesn't work as well as the cells, but the juice actually worked. And I think ultimately what you're going to see is this juice, these trophic factors these cells produce. You can take them and get them, stimulate them to produce massive amounts of trophic factors. And you can isolate those trophic factors. And then if somebody has a spinal cord injury, you transplant, you put a catheter right at the injury site with a pump. I mean, we have back, bacophon pumps. We have pain pumps, all these, you know, antispasmodic pumps. It's, the technology is already there. You just need to place a catheter and then secrete, you know, just... Give them the signal, and I think the spinal cords regenerate. And I think that's ultimately where we're going to be in, you know, 10 or 15 years. So in summary, you know, these cells, they home to damaged, damaged areas. They persist at least for a period of time. We don't know how long. In Norman India, I was just talking to Dr. Shapiro, who's here from New York. Thank you for coming all the way from New York. And she, uh, she's working with an immunologist at uh, UMDNJ up uh, in, in New Jersey there. And, I, and that brought back memories of Norman Indy. Norman Indy is the guy. Yeah.